Carlos flew all the way from Campinas, Brazil, to join us today, and he was born Carlos Roberto Martins, Martins and um, learned to work at an early age when his father took him from town to town selling goods from their family truck. Carlos was 12 years old when he joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and the missionaries taught him English. After his Michigan mission in Portugal, Carlos married his sweetheart, Vanya. Facing a future of poverty, the couple decided to seek a prosperity with God's help, promising to tithe and be generous with his, their offerings. The first blessing came when Carlos accepted, was accepted to come to BYU. He earned a degree in computer science and with the help of the Lamanite scholarship, with the help of the Lamanite scholarship. By the age of 30, he was a company executive in Brazil. Then Carlos was asked by a co-worker to teach him English. Others followed, and soon Carlos was making more money teaching English than he was at his corporate job. So Carlos quit his job, invested in what he called the Wizard Language Institute, and built it into a chain of 3,000 schools, the largest in the world. The business was so successful that so many people associated him with the name of his schools that Carlos decided to legally change his middle name to Wizard. <laughs> but that's not the end of the story. Carlos and Vanya recently sold their business and now look forward to expanding their philanthropy. And we are so thrilled to have Carlos Wizard Marchines speak to us today. Welcome. Dear brothers and sisters, I'd like to thank President Worthen for this invitation for me to come to the PLC this year and share some of the experiences I have had in the last 25 years and to bear my testimony to you. I like this statement very much from President Kevin Worthen. He said, your success will ultimately be measured by what you become, by your character. The real question to be asked is, how close are we to reaching our full potential? The BYU mission statement indicates that this is a place where the full realization of human potential is pursued. And that potential is greater than many in the world imagine, because all human beings are beloved spirits, sons or daughters of heavenly parents, and as such, each has a divine nature and destiny. As the church expands its reach throughout the world, we see more clearly the mission of BYU in helping prepare local leaders to support, to strengthen, and to lead the church in these areas. As a convert to the church, I could not help recognize the influence this great institution has had in the eternal destiny of thousands of international students. Let me share with you how the miracle of conversion happened in our family and my pursuit of coming to BYU one day began. Back in the 60s, as a faithful member of the church, Joseph Ataides worked in Curitiba, Brazil as an elevator operator. As my father entered one day in that elevator, he saw Brother Joseph reading a book that seemed to be a Bible. And then he asked, Brother, are you reading the Bible? To which Joseph replied, I am reading the Book of Mormon. Are you a Mormon too? To which branch do you belong? Up to that moment, my father had never heard of the word Mormon. So he just replied, I belong to the branch of business and commerce. <laughs> Joseph then made the golden question to my dad. Can I send two missionaries to visit your home? My dad asked, what are they going to talk about? And Joseph simply replied, about Jesus Christ. He could not have given a better answer to my dad at that moment. My father gave him our home address and left the elevator. And I always think it must have been a very old elevator to give them plenty of time 
to have this kind of conversation. <laughs> and time enough for him to have that address and the family. Well, a few weeks, a few weeks passed by, and one night, two young men, dressed in suits, white shirts, and ties, knocked at our door, accompanied by whom? That humble man on his bicycle that worked in that elevator. I opened the door and I asked them what they wanted. They said they wanted to talk to my father. And I said, my father is not home. And then they asked again, what time will your dad be back? And I said, he's out of town and he'll probably be back just by the end of the week. In that case, we will come back another day because we want to see your dad. When I went back inside the house, my mom asked, son, who are those men in suits at the front gate? And I replied to my mom, mom, I really don't know. They just wanted to talk to dad. And what do they do, son? I said, mom, I really don't know. I think they are with IRS. <laughs> and so, son, what did they say? They said they will come back because they need to talk to father. Those young men promised, and they really came back. I found out they were not with IRS. They were not even Brazilians. They were the missionaries Brother Joseph had promised to send to our home. Through those kind missionaries, Elder Stephen Fitzer and Elder Roger Mangum, and I get emotional just to think that they are here with us, sitting at this front table. A big hand of applause to them. <laughs> with a deep love for the local people, who came to know the, we came to know the gospel of Jesus Christ. A few weeks prior to our baptism, my father told the missionaries, Look, elders, we need to have a strong testimony of the church before we can join. The elders very inspiredly told my dad that every night before retiring to go to bed, he should gather together the family, mom and dad, plus seven small children, kneel down around the bed, and each of the seven kids, from the youngest to the oldest, plus the parents, should ask Heavenly Father if this was the path the Lord had prepared for the family to follow. Brothers and sisters, I really get emotional just to think that it did not take too long till all of us knew for certainty that the Lord had prepared and guided those two angel missionaries to bring the good news of the restored gospel to our home. And from that point on, a new chapter was being written in our family life. My parents, who are sitting at this table today, and I'm very pleased to have them with us, found what they had been looking for for such a long time. A church that would help them raise the kids and keep the family together. Joining the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints made it possible for my parents to obtain what they, hate, they never had before, support, direction, and spiritual guidance. We began to hold family home evenings, Life began to have a purpose beyond simply working to gain material goods and pay the bills at the end of the month. We began to have a perspective of an eternal family. Today, my father, at age 80, frequently affirms that the best decision he ever made was the decision to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ and live a life of faith based on virtue and integrity. And he often repeats this, the restored gospel of Jesus Christ made me a better father, a better husband, a better worker, a better citizen, in short, a better child of God. When a temple was dedicated in the city of Curitiba, Brazil, in the year 2000, it was a humbling experience for my parents, the children and grandchildren, to reunite again with that faithful member of the church, Joseph Ataides, who as an elevator operator opened the doors of the gospel to our family. 
with the help of the missionaries. At the age of 12, I began to learn English, and those elders encouraged me to prepare to one day study at Brigham Young University. Since my father had low income and my mother was a seamstress with seven small kids to raise, to think of going abroad and study in an international university seemed like an impossible dream. But somehow, those elders instilled in me a desire and a vision that would never leave my heart. When I served a mission in Portugal, President W. Lynn Pinegar, who is also with us at the table here in the front, often encouraged me to attend BYU. When I returned home from my mission, this became my number one goal. But soon I learned the lesson written in Isaiah 55, 8 through 9, that says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways Neither are your ways my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Little did I know then that in spite of my strong desire to come to study at Brigham Young University, the Lord had other plans for me before I came to this renowned institution. One year after I returned from the mission, I married Vanya Pimentel, a wonderful young woman who would forever change my life. Two months after our wedding, we suddenly found out that she was expecting not one child, but twins. Three months after our wedding, to my completely surprise, I was called as the Bishop of the Word. As you can see, I did not plan for this. And then, finally, at age 26, I was accepted at BYU. As a foreign student on campus, I was confronted with serious academic challenges. I had been away from school for a long time. When my first semester grades came out, it was a heavy blow. My grades were very poor. I was overcome by a deep sense of inability, incapacity, and frustration. I was afraid to arrive home and show my grades to my wife. As I walked home, I felt like the child who gets poor grades in school and is afraid to, say the, uh, to face the parents with his report card. I mentally prepared my own defense, how I was going to explain my lack of success to my wife. I told myself that I was not cut out for studying, especially in the United States. It would be better for me just to give up, get out of school. I decided then I was not going to waste my time at BYU. I should go back immediately to Brazil. Over and over, this went through my head as I walked home. And I, when I arrived at the basement where we lived on Provo 500 North, I quietly went in, hoping to avoid to see Vanya. She was actually waiting for me. With a, with a sad countenance, I showed her my grades. You are right. Some of the grades are pretty bad, she said. I know, but don't worry, honey. I already know what I'm going to do to solve this problem. You mean to improve your grades? No, sweetheart. I've made up my mind. This university stuff is too complicated, too much, too hard. I didn't expect this. So what do you do? What do you plan to do? What's your plan? What plan do you have in mind? And then I said, my plan is for us to go back immediately to Brazil. At this moment, I think this is the best thing that we can do. And then she reacted immediately. After all the sacrifice we have made to get here, you want to pack our bags and leave our dreams behind and go back home now? And what about the goal that we have set for our life? And please, Carlos, don't tell me that we left our home in Brazil in order for you to study in the United States, and now you're going to give up after the first semester. And then she added, I don't know how long it's going to take for you, but until you get your degree, we're not going to back home. I don't care if you have to take the same course one time, two times, three times, or as many times as it takes. Until you graduate, 
we will not return to our home. And then she added this. Imagine what our kids are going to say about their dad. They will know that their father gave up after the first obstacle. What kind of life lesson will that be for them? So, Carlos, keep this in mind. We will leave BYU after your graduation. So, dear brothers and sisters, as you can see, I had no way out. <laughs> and I get emotional to think that if I am here today speaking at this PLC, it's because an angel called Vanya gave me the right support in a moment when I need it most. And if it were not for her, I really don't know what I would be doing at this moment or who I would have become. Regarding the importance of choosing the right person to be our eternal companion, President James E. Faust taught us, we make no greater volunteer choice in this life than the selection of a marriage partner. This decision can bring eternal happiness and joy. To find sublime fulfillment in marriage, both partners need to be fully committed to the marriage. So again, at that moment that I was ready to give up, my spouse reminded me of Isaiah 55, 8 through 9. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. Your ways are not my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts higher than your thoughts. If I were to follow my own instinct, instinct and thoughts, maybe I would have never graduated from this university or from any other university. But the Lord, in his infinite wisdom and love, knows each of us. In fact, he knows us better than we know ourselves because he knows us and he knows our spirit from the pre-existence. Since he knows the end from the beginning, he knows our potential in this life and throughout eternity. And so the Lord expects more from us as we try to reach our full intellectual, emotional, and spiritual maturity. So in addition to the support from my wife and the assistance from great teachers, counselors, advisors, and especially my sponsor, Duke Cowley, I finally was able to graduate. So, dear brothers and sisters, I know that you have a great spirit of charity. I know that you have a great spirit of generosity in your heart. And sometimes I know that you as donors, my question, to what extent you are influencing the lives of students on campus. I am here today in the name of all students who at some point received financial assistance from you to express my sincere and deep gratitude for your valuable contribution, for the immense impact that you make possible in the lives of so many. And as the Lord blesses us, blesses each of us with temporal resources, I consider a great, great blessing to be able to return, to contribute back to a unique university that has such a noble, unique principles, as so well described by President Wilkinson. The success of any institution of higher education and the value of its contribution to society as a whole rests primarily upon its faculty. At Brigham Young University, faculty members are chosen, as in any other great universities, for academic scholarship and competence, degrees and distinctions, achievements and recognition in research and creative endeavors. But a difference is that they are chosen at BYU primarily for worth as outstanding teachers and also for a spirit of service loyalty, adherence to the principles of the gospel, the most objective experiment and most carefully documented facts take on an added dimension when they are presented by a man or a woman who is a worthy recipient of divine inspiration. Our concern is for the whole student, his spiritual as well as his academic development and the way he lives as much as what he studies. 
I don't think there is an entire world, another institution of higher institution, such with such a concern for the spiritual development of its student body as we find here on this campus. With the knowledge and the spirit that we received here, we are able to make decisions on a higher level of understanding, much higher than if we had just to rely on our academic preparation. After graduation, my wife and I had to make another important decision. And now the question was, should we return home to Brazil or should we stay here in the comfort of America? Interestingly enough, now I wanted to stay in America. And my wife wanted to go back home. She kept re reminding me of this. Carlos, our purpose in coming to BYU was for you to graduate and then to follow the counsel of the prophets, to get an education, return home, make a mark, serve the kingdom with the spiritual maturity, with the understanding and with the commitment to follow church leaders we learn here on campus. This helped us make the decision at that moment that was so vital where we wanted to see what the Lord had in store for us. So we left the comfort and security of a life of, uh, of comfort here in America and we returned home only with the faith that the Lord would provide for our well-being and take care of us in our own home country. Back in Brazil, as was mentioned here in my introduction, I started working in an American company as an executive. I could not know then that again Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 would have an impact in my life and would have forever changed my career. As mentioned here, one day a co-worker asked me, Carlos, can you teach us some English lessons in the evening? So I started teaching English at home for one student, two students, three students, one class, two classes, three classes, until the moment came I had no more time available in the evening for one more student. At that point, I had to make a, a decision between being an employee, a teacher, or becoming an entrepreneur. My wife and I began to think, should we open a school? As we sought the Lord's inspiration, one scene from the famous movie, A Fiddler on the Roof, came to my mind. As you remember well, at one point, Tevia lifts his eyes heavenward and begins a dialogue with the Creator. And you know the movie well. Dear God, what would happen if I were a rich man? What would happen if I had a fortune, even if it was a small fortune? Would it follow your plans? Thus, imbued with faith and the confidence in the Lord, with the belief that He listens and answers our prayers, I asked, Dear Heavenly Father, what path should we follow? What should we apply? How should we apply the gifts the Lord has given us, even though we do not fully understand what these gifts are. The answer did come. And at that moment, I had an assurance that those English lessons would be my lifelong project. And do you know what, brothers and sisters, and especially students that are here with us this afternoon? It's interesting how we sometimes receive an inspiration from the Lord and then we want to confirm with our friends to know if what the Lord has revealed to us was right. This happened to me. So I went to talk to my friends to see what they had to say about my perspective of opening a language school. And now I ask you a question, dear brothers and sisters. I want you to guess, try to imagine what my friends told me then. And what you're thinking in your mind, they said, Carlos, you are crazy. Don't do this. There's a lot of competition in the market. And now is a bad time to start a business. We are facing an economic crisis. And, even, and some even said, Carlos, please remember, there is no bright future in teaching. Can you imagine what my feeling was at that moment, 
I really did not expect this negative reaction from my friends. So what did I do then? I confess to you that I went home and I cried. <laughs> what did my friends do then? Ha, 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 ha. I knew that he was going to give up. I knew that he was not going to go too far. I knew that this plan was not going to work. Well, time passed by. And today, I am the one that laughs. <laughs> what about my friends? Some of my friends cry. And why is it that some of my friends cry? Because maybe some of them also had some plans, projects, ideals, dreams, but they were so focused in their inner fears, in their imaginary ghosts, that they never gave themselves a chance for, them, for their dream to come, to be realized. So now you know how the wizard school uh, was initiated in Brazil. Not only Wizard School, but later on, we made acquisitions of other companies so that we built uh, the largest uh, group of education, bilingual education in the country, with a total of 3,000 schools, generating approximately 50,000 jobs, uh, serving approximately 1 million students each year, present in several countries. And as some of you know, last year, uh, our company was sold to Pearson for the amount of $700 million. Our capacity for planning and envisioning our future is very limited. We only can see with our natural eyes. We just see a short distance ahead. But the Lord, in His infinite love, care, and wisdom, can see gifts and talents in us that we ourselves sometimes cannot see. And then if we are humble and seek his divine influence in our lives, the Lord will lead us by the hand to paths that in our wildest dreams we could have never imagined. What began as a modest project of teaching English at home in the evening was the embryo of wizard schools, which in turn became the largest chain of language schools in the world. As the result of an earnest and sincere prayer made all the difference in my personal and professional path because I knew that at any moment I could fall back on that same source of inspiration for support, guidance, direction. In spite of the controversial opinions from my friends, that answer to my prayer gave me assurance confidence and strength to persevere on the path the Lord had already prepared. Now, for all of you parents and grandparents of missionaries, at this moment I'd like to express my sincere thanks for sending your sons and your grandsons throughout the world due to your faith and to the exemplary work that the American missionaries perform throughout the world the kingdom of God expands its reach and blesses the lives of thousands in almost every land. As I look back on the impact those two young missionaries had on the, on the eternal destiny of our family, and now we have almost a hundred members of our immediate family as members of the church, I cannot help become emotional filled with gratitude to think that my parents' soul-searching quest was achieved. Antonio and Hilda, they raised their seven children in unity as they wish. Six of them had the opportunity and blessing to serve a full-time mission for the church. In turn, they were sealed in the temple and raised their kids to serve dozens of other missions in different, different parts of the world. As we envision eternity, we know what the eye have not seen, the ear have not heard, neither have entered into the heart of man are the things which the Lord has prepared for those that love him. All these miracles are conversions. In many lands, could not have taken place if it not for you, 
devoted parents and grandparents for your devotion in preparing, supporting, and sending your sons, daughters, grandsons, and granddaughters to serve missions throughout the world. I really commend you for your insurmountable contribution to this great cause. A few years ago, I spoke an invitation of President Will Wright at BYU Hawaii, and then I shared an experience of a missionary story with students on campus. And I met Brother Jim recently, and Brother Jim said, why don't you share that missionary experience with us? Because at the time, that was the only thing that we can remember from your talk in Hawaii. So I promised Brother Jim, who is here in the audience with us, that I will share with you that missionary experience. So following the spirit, very well established by President David McKay, every member a missionary, some time ago, I started the new year with the resolution of passing out 365 Pesalon cards within a year's time. I thought, giving out one Pesalon card a day is a very worthwhile goal. However, at the end of the first month of the year, January, I had already given out about 100 cards. Then I thought, maybe I should increase my goal. Maybe 365 is too little. Why not pass out 1,000 cards this year? And I decided to do that. Then at the end of February, I had already passed out 300 cards. Then in the spirit of prayer, I start pondering. Dear Lord, what would be a realistic goal to accomplish during this year's time as far as passing out these pass along cards? As a response to this desire to be a member missionary, the Holy Ghost inspired me with this idea. Listen, Carlos, the website of your school receives approximately 200,000 hits a month. Why not place a virtual pass along card on the website so that users can access that pass along, virtual pass along card, leave their name and address so they can receive a free copy of the Book of Mormon, a DVD on faith, Finding Faith in Christ, or the booklet, Three Simple Ways of Having a Happier Family. Well, I thought, that's a great idea. And I decided immediately to implement that plan. Then one more inspiration came to my mind. Dear Lord, is there anything else we could do to spread the message of the restoration. As the Spirit clear spoke this to my mind, I can feel a moment of revelation then. I could almost hear this. Your school distributes approximately half a million books a year to students all over the country. Why not insert a pass along card inside each book? And then we immediately start doing that. We are authorized by the area presence in Brazil to print our own pass along cards. Of course, you didn't want to generate this cost to the church, right? <laughs> the church office in Brazil gave us even an exclusive 100 number so that we could measure the number of calls we received through this initiative. Dear brothers and sisters, as a result from these two initiatives, each month we start receiving 5,000 phone calls or contacts from people all over the country requesting some church literature. We know that in this audience we have many, math many mathematicians and statisticians, and you know that when you have 4,000 people requesting church literature every month, at the end of the month, you will have a percentage of these people that will end up receiving the discussions from the missionaries, reading the Book of Mormon, attending the meetings, praying to know the truth, and finally becoming members of the Church of Jesus Christ. So, I ask now this select audience, what do we learn from this experience, brothers and sisters? Several lessons. One. Every member indeed is a missionary. Two, we should be anxiously engaged in a good cause because the power is within us 
to do much good. Three, the Lord does answer our prayers according to our desires. Four, when we receive a prompting from the Spirit, we must immediately obey. The Lord, number five, does expand our vision. What started out as a New Year's resolution of passing out one card a day turned out to be an inspired missionary effort of bringing thousands of referrals for the church each month. I talked to Brother Palmer and his nephew recently returned from Brazil and he said, my uncle, I have received the the largest number of referrals that we received as companionships came from the wizard schools. And my sister Celia, who's in the audience with us today, sent me an email just a week ago. And her son, Michael, just got called to Brazil. And when he arrived in the country, he was made companion with Elder Gasparino. And then Elder Gasparino said, by the way, are you related to Carlos Martins? Because you look like Carlos Martins. <laughs> then he said, I am his nephew. So next time you talk to your uncle, tell him that I am a member of the church. Because once I was a student from Wizard, and every semester I would receive a new Pestalone card. <laughs> and I had a collection of cards. And one day my mom asked me, have you called them already to receive the gift? And he said, I have not. So call them. I called them. The missionaries came to bring the gift. And the gift, a conversion. So I get emotional just to think that in this existence, we're never going to be able to measure the influence of our testimony, of our faith, of our example, that other people that are around us, we cannot measure that influence but I am positive, brothers and sisters, that one day we will find out and we will be surprised by that influence. And again, as we read in Isaiah 55, 18 and 9, Your thoughts are not my thoughts, and your ways are not my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Because all of these miracles, large and small, I cannot help but recognize the hand of the Lord guiding me in every step along this journey, in this mortality. Every time I get interviewed by some national news, newspaper, magazine, or television station, I make a point to mention my affiliation with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and the impact the restored gospel has had in my life. When I think of the countless blessings brought to our family as a result of that member missionary reading the Book of Mormon in that elevator that day, I am inspired to become a better member missionary and strive to share the gospel with as many people that I possibly can. When I think of the impact of BYU had in my own business career, in my profession, I am motivated to contribute to this marvelous institution. When I think of the love and the mercy of God in my life, I feel inclined to show love and mercy to all those people around me. May the Lord bless each of us as we seek to do His will. Through faith in His name is my sincere prayer in the name of of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Indeed, we've been inspired today, and we want to thank Carlos. President Worthen, if you would come up. We have a gift for you here, Carlos, to thank you in an inadequate way for taking the time to prepare this wonderful message. And by that, 
I mean, taking the time beginning when you were 12 years old to prepare for this. But this, as you will see, uh, those of you who can see, and maybe now all of you can see, this is the signature piece in our Museum of Christ, uh, Karl Bloch, Christ Healing the Sick at Bethesda. And how fitting in terms of his testimony of the gospel and the source from which we get our help, we want to thank Carlos for his preparation and for his contributions to Brigham Young University. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you very much.